Please be seated. Amen. And now, Lord, during this time of preaching, we look to you to speak to us. We look to you to send your Holy Spirit to open up our ears to hear, our eyes to see, our hearts to understand, and to help us become willing to do your will for Jesus' sake and for our salvation, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today we are in Philippians, as we just heard uh, the passage read, one of my favorite books of the Bible um, from the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is hard to understand for a lot of people uh, because he was such a brilliant um, Jewish scholar of his day. Sometimes whenever, whenever, and I think this is still true, whenever we know that someone is really bright, we tend to approach their, their lectures or their books or, or anything they uh, anything they produce uh, with a certain air of expectation, expecting brilliance and intellectualism and things like that. Um, and when we do that, often we tend to misunderstand what the person is trying to say. Sometimes we think brilliance has to sound a certain way, and because we're expecting a certain sound, we miss the message that they're trying to present to us. And this is the case with the Apostle Paul. He has a lot to teach us, but because he's so bright, oftentimes Paul is misunderstood. Many people, as I said, approach him as a scholar, and he was a scholar, as a Pharisee, and he was a Pharisee. Um, and so with all that in mind, we have to approach Paul with a, from a certain perspective that really um, presents the man himself to us in such a way where we can interact with the man and hear the man and understand what the man is trying to say and not be confused by what the man is trying to say because this was a problem in Paul's day. Uh, as I was reading in Second Peter this week, I was reminded of the passage where Peter said to his, his readers, um, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. Now listen to what he says of Paul's letters and how some people interact with them. He said, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction. So you see, people are understanding Paul or approaching Paul with the expectation that because he's brilliant, his words will be confusing and not straightforward. But his words are actually pretty straightforward if you understand the man. And so this morning, I'd like to share one key approach that I use uh, that helps me understand Paul and what he's trying to teach us, uh, when, especially when passages seem difficult, and especially when those, those, uh, those passages are around the topic of devotion to God or things of that. And here it is. This is the one key approach that will revolutionize the way you think of Paul. At one point in Paul's life, he was a scholar. He was primarily an intellectual. That's how he went about through the world, as an intellectual. But then he met someone. Then he fell in love, and his approach to life changed completely. So here's a question, because I know this has happened uh, to many of you, or maybe you know someone that this has happened to. How many of you know someone, or how many have had the experience of doing something out of character after falling in love? It don't have to be something bad. Just something that would be, you know, he wouldn't do that. You know, I heard one preacher say um, one time his high school uh, son came home and all of a sudden he started cleaning his room and he started ironing his clothes. And the next morning he came downstairs with cologne on and he looked at his wife and he said, it's a girl. <laughs> and it was a girl, right? He had found someone that his heart desired and it changed the way he lived his life. You know, some of you are probably here in Ohio because you met someone that lived in Ohio. And so even though you planned on living somewhere else and doing something else, because you found someone, because your heart was now part of the, uh, the decision-making factor, you took a left turn when all of your plans and all of your intentions were to keep on going straight. Falling in love makes a normal person all of a sudden be different in the world. This is what happened to Paul. And it's important that we understand Paul from the perspective of someone that fell in love and had their life radically changed. 
So I've been thinking about Paul. You, you guys know I love, I love Christmas music. I also love Disney music. And so um, this week, as I was listening to Cinderella, it occurred to me, <laughs> this has the Apostle Paul written all over it, man. You know, this has the Apostle Paul written all over it. You guys know the song that Cinderella sings? So this is love. Who knows that song? Well, I did all of you the favor by printing the lyrics here on the screen. So let's all sing it together, shall we? Look at Paul, he's in love. So let's sing together. So this is love. Mm -hmm. So this is love. So this is what makes life divine. I'm all aglow. Mm -hmm. And now I know the key to all heaven is mine. My heart has wings. Mm -hmm. And I can fly. I'll touch every star in the sky. So this is the miracle that I've been dreaming of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is love. Is not that. Clap for yourselves, ladies and gentlemen. From now on, when you watch Cinderella, I hope you think of Paul. <laughs> And keep that in mind as you listen to this passage. The passage that Tyler just read for us is really complex, and Paul's like weaving in and out trying to explain himself. He sounds like a madman, or he sounds like someone that's in love, and that's exactly who he is. So as he's engaging, what he's doing is, in this passage, he's engaging this question of what it means to be a really good person what it means to be righteous. And this actually is, is, is one of the questions that have been asked by uh, leaders of every generation in different forms and in different formats. Everyone's trying to engage this question about what does it mean to be a really good person? Or to phrase it another way, what does it mean to have the good life? That question will never die. Everyone that lives wants to know how to live well how to become good. And so every culture has its doctors and its scholars and its philosophers and its psychologists and its pastors and preachers and teachers and even artists who are trying to help the people of their day live well. Maybe some of you are engaged in that work of interacting with other people. Maybe you're a psychiatrist and you interact with people because you wanna help them live in harmony with themselves. You wanna, you wanna help them live the good life. And the Bible is a book that also deals with this issue. What does it mean for human beings to live well? The Greek word that's used uh, in the Bible to describe living well is dikaiosune. Can you guys say that, dikaiosune? Dikaiosune. Okay, he, you sounded like a Dothraki uh, person, but that's okay. Dothrakis can live the dikaiosune life as well, um, if they wanted to, I suppose. But I suppose they wouldn't want to be, well, never mind. Okay, so here's what, here's what dikaiosune means. Dikaiosune, it means righteousness in our wooden translation of the word. But the problem with going from Hebrew or Greek to English is that English is way too, um, way too simple. I know English is, is our language, but it's not a beautiful language in comparison to some of the classics. And so when we translate things from Greek to English, we lose some of the beauty that it contains. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, like, um, it's like turning a paragraph into one word. Sometimes that happens when we go from the Greek to the English or from Hebrew to English. So here's what dikaiosune or righteousness means. In a broad sense, it means the state of a person when they are as they ought to be. That's dikaiosune. Or the thing about a person that makes him or her really good. So whatever that quality is that you can't explain, that's the kaisune, or true inner goodness. If you've ever read Plato's uh, Republic, then you've read about the kaisune, but there he translates it as the word um, justice. But it's all the same. It's all that idea of how can human beings have the good life? 
How can, how can we help them arrange their lives in such a way that they can live well? It's the kaiasune. And so in the Bible, most frequently when we see people trying to engage with the masses, what they're doing, albeit from a religious perspective, is trying to teach them what it looks like to have dikaiosune or to be righteous. And in this passage, there's a portion that we didn't read where Paul is addressing um, something that these Judaizers, who are people who believe, as Paul used to believe, that righteousness comes from how we observe the, the law of God or the Old Testament law. That's how righteousness comes. And we, we encounter these people often through the New Testament, through the Pharisees and the Sadducees or the scribes. Now, they're not being malicious. You know, they're just trying to share with people what they know. In the same way, you may go out and tell somebody, here's how I go about trying to be a good person. And if it's worked for you, it would be wise and good for you to share it with somebody else. But in this instant, these people are coming to the people of God who have just become Christians. And they're trying to help them see, here's the way to be really good. And so for Paul, uh, someone who... Um, who used to believe that way and really covets the spirit and the growth of these people, he's trying to come against their methodology of becoming righteous. For they're coming with a methodology that says, in order to be right, you have to accomplish all these really good things. You have to study, you have to pray, you have to do all these things. And if you can stack up all of these uh, religious accomplishments, these divine accomplishments, if people look at you and you have like a resume filled with good deeds, then you're righteous. You know, and I think that's kind of the model that we still have, at least the one that's dominant in our cultures. It's not necessarily connected to religion, um, but it is connected to accomplishments. Just look at the people that we lift up as role models in our lives. It's, it's usually uh, people who are successful, people who have a claim, Last week at the, uh, the award show, you know, there were people who, who made great accomplishments in their field. Those are the ones that unwittingly we point to them and we say, here's the good life. Look at your magazine covers. Look at the commercials of retirement and things like that. In, in our own way, we're presenting to, to one another what we think the Kayasune really looks like. Without intending it, we're sharing a gospel that says, here is the path towards goodness, towards wholeness, towards righteousness. And that's what these Judaizers were doing in their own way. They've been going about to these newly formed Christian communities with the law. And instead of magazines that have all these beautiful people with chiseled bodies and, and huge portfolios, they have the law of God and they say, if you keep these things, then you're gonna be righteous. Then you're gonna be well off. Embrace Judaism and keep the law, and you too can have the good life. Well, Paul comes on the scene, and he doesn't try to argue with them because he just, he's not interested in, in engaging with an argument. But instead, he shows these Philippians that he's been down the road that they're describing already. He's been down that road, and he's discovered that it actually doesn't lead to dikaiosune or righteousness. Listen again to what Paul says. He says, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, the flesh is, is merely um, the, the, good, the accomplishments that are here on earth. When you think of flesh, don't think about something bad. Just think about your earthly accomplishments, the things that you can stack on your resume. So he says, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. And now Paul's going to boast according to the logic of these Judaizers. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. That's really good if you're a Jewish boy. You know, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm a member of the people of Israel, so my heritage is good. Of the tribe of Benjamin, so my heritage is even better. I was a Hebrew born of the Hebrews, which means I didn't convert into this. I was born into this. As to the law, I was a Pharisee. You can't get any better than that. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. Now, we may say, well, that's not, a, that's not something to put on your resume. For Jewish people, it was. For Jewish people, it shows this person was so zealous that he went out of his way to remove people that were against his God. 
So that on his resume stacked up very high. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. And as to righteousness under the law, I was completely blameless. I kept the law as perfectly as I could. So what he's doing is he's stacking up his accolades with the accolades of these Judaizers that are coming into town trying to convince people that righteousness comes through observing the law. It reminds me of a quote by Jim Carrey from a few years ago when he said, I wish everyone could experience being rich and famous so that, so that they can see that it's not the answer to anything. And that's what Paul's saying here. I wish people could have experienced observing the law like I did. I went further than anybody, and it's not the answer to anything. Now, he's not saying that the law is bad. In fact, Paul hasn't given up on practicing the law. He's still a practicing Jew. But what he's saying is that he doesn't see the law as a source of righteousness, as they do. So he knows that if he keeps the law perfectly, it's not going to make him any better. It's not going to make him any more righteous. It's not going to fill him with dikaiosune. So if dikaiosune, or the good life, doesn't come through accomplishing good things, then how does one become righteous? That's the question that, that's kind of left up in the air that they need to answer. How does one become righteous? Here's Paul's answer. And listen to the love language here. This isn't Paul's head speaking. This is Paul's heart speaking. Whatever gains or accomplishments I had, these I have come to regard as loss. Listen, because of Christ, I met somebody. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Do you see what he's doing? He's saying, hey, I met somebody. I met somebody who in himself is the Kayasune. He, I met goodness. Can you imagine saying, I met goodness? We all look for joy, but what if, your, what if your spouse came home and said, hey, man, I ran into the embodiment of joy today. I ran into mercy today. Not someone named mercy, but someone who in themselves contains all that mercy is. That's what Paul's saying. I met somebody. Righteousness for Paul, the kayasune for Paul, is a person. It's not something to be achieved. It's someone to know. That's what Paul's saying. And so, in other words, he's saying, if you want to become righteous and have the good life, you got to get to know this person. You got to get to know this Jesus, because he's the embodiment of all those things that you're seeking. You got to get to know him. So then he goes on to, to describe his discovery of this by telling them how it felt when he met Christ. Now, listen to this. Tell me that this is not a love letter. I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Here's what he's saying. When you gain Christ through a trusting relationship, you begin to see everything else as rubbish. We've, we've experienced this before. If you've ever been to a party with kids and, you know, suppose one of your kids likes uh, a little Corvettes. And so you're thinking, you know, wait until he sees this matchbox car that I bought him, you know, limited edition, cherry red. He's going to lose it when he sees this. And so some, some parties, all the kids open up their presents in front of everybody. I actually think that's a bad idea, you know, because I've experienced what can happen. Here's what happens. You give your son the, the Corvette, he opens it. Oh, dad, thank you so much. I've wanted this my entire life. He keeps on opening presents. Your brother-in-law comes, and he has a big box. Your son opens it up. What's in there? A Power Wheel cherry red Corvette, <laughs> right? What has happened to the matchbox car that your son was previously excited about? It's rubbish. He may not even know where it is anymore. You've experienced this on Christmas morning. Hey, where's the, the doll that your grandma just bought you? I don't know. Why? Because the kids are playing with the toy that they're most excited about. The toy that they're most excited about has surpassed the value of the thing that they were previously excited about. 
That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying that's what it's like to know Christ. It makes everything else seem like BS. And that's the word he literally uses in the Greek. If you read the King James, it says, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but dung, except for knowing Christ, that I may win Christ. So Paul's in love. His heart has encountered a man who in himself captivates everything that he's ever been looking for. And he's telling these Philippians, don't place any confidence in doing things in order to become righteous. Place confidence in meeting the one who is in and of, in, in and of himself the embodiment of Dikaiosune. Let everything you do be done with the effort of knowing him in an interactive way. And as you do that, you will experience righteousness bubbling up from the inside of you. That's Paul's invitation to them, and it's his invitation to us to experience Christ, to value Christ more than we value anything else. Not by calculating it, not by doing math, because that's not how you fall in love, is it? You don't sit down one day like, wait, let me see, well, if I... Huh, if I take this divided by that and carry the one, yeah, I do love her, you know? You don't do that. You just discover one day that you're willing to drive 18 hours across country to be with somebody, and you think it makes sense. Everyone else thinks you're insane. But what, what's making the decision? Your heart. Paul says get to know Christ that way. And when we get to know Christ that way and we see what that Christ has done for us. Hmm. <laughs> right? So this is love. He says your heart will break. Your heart will break. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the real embodiment of love for us. Broken for us, poured out for us that we may have life. So this is love. Not that we loved you first, but that you first loved us. God, there's so many things that want to connect to our hearts, that want, to, that want us to love them. Those things have value in and of themselves, we know. But I pray that each and every one of us can, can meet you, the real you, in everything that we do. Come, Holy Spirit, and transform these lowly elements of bread and juice into the body and blood of the one who loved us so much. Make them be for us his body and his blood in order that we might be for the world the body and blood of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat it. And the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation, poured out for all of us that we might have life. Take and drink all of it with thankful hearts. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your goodness and your mercy, which is better than life to us. And we trust now that your Holy Spirit is working within us to minister the love of Christ through us and to help recalibrate our hearts towards what is good and holy and righteous. Not because we're gonna work really hard at it because you're at work within us. So we trust that that work is taking place and we give you thanks in Jesus' name, amen.